Hello and welcome to today's Manhattan Project meeting of the LaRouche Organization for Saturday, October 22nd. Today's meeting is called, Will Sane Voices in the Anglosphere Stop Their Failed States from Launching Thermonuclear War? And it's going to be dedicated to discussing the crisis of leadership and confidence and consciousness and cognition in Perfidious Albion, sometimes known as Great Britain or not so Great Britain these days. What we're going to do is we're going to begin with something from 1996 from Lyndon LaRouche, uh, and it's called Overturning the Axioms That Are Leading Us to Catastrophe. The subject, the actual subject of these two days events is the subject of history as tragedy because we are living in a real tragedy when a person says to me why don't you give answers in bite-sized doses like the other politicians <laughs> why don't you take a poll and find out what the people want to hear and state your proposition in terms of the prejudices which they already have, as the polls tell you. My answer would be, I'm not a fool. <laughs> because what is dooming us is not Richard Nixon. What is dooming us is not George Bush, much as he tries. <laughs> what is dooming us is our people what our people believe because these people we like to blame we talk about the crooked politicians we talk about the conspirators on Wall Street we talk about this we talk about that always blaming someone else and if they're a public figure as in the old days when some people wore top hats it was more fun to throw a snowball at a top hat. <laughs> so we always blame somebody else. Now, the job of a leader is not to blame leaders. We can point out some are bad, some are defective, some are utterly immoral, some are barely human. But the problem lies in the people, not in the leaders. The problem often of oppression lies in the oppressed because they will not accept any proposition that is not consistent with the assumption that they must remain the oppressed. Now we wish to make that clear this weekend. We now have a civilization, a worldwide civilization, which is doomed in its present form. Over the next months or years, this civilization which people talk about, their opinions, their culture, their prejudices, their way of life, their traditions, are all gone. Nothing can save it. And it's like clinging to a stateroom on the Titanic. If you cling to those traditions, you go down and drown with it. We have to get the people off the Titanic, off traditions, into the lifeboats so they may be saved. In order to do that, we have to attack what people believe is the most precious private opinion. Like the fellow who tells you, the poor ignorant fellow who says, I know all about things, I follow, read the newspapers and watch television. Which means he knows nothing. Because he has confidence in these things as sources of so-called information. And this is the thing we must make clear. Now... If you just joined us, that was Lyndon LaRouche discussing overturning the axioms that are leading us to catastrophe. And you're watching the Manhattan Project meeting of the LaRouche organization. The crisis of Great Britain will sane voices in the Anglosphere stop their failed states from launching thermonuclear war. Now, speaking about the idea of overturning axioms, we're going to bring on for a moment just an excerpt from an expert, Hillary Clinton who will be discussing with us the extraordinarily stupid axiom that the United States used in the question of Afghanistan and its aftermath. 
We're building a relationship that just did not exist. I said in our last trip when you were with me that we had a huge trust deficit, in part because the United States had, to be, to be fair, we had helped to create the problem we're now fighting. How? Because when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, we had this brilliant idea that we were going to come to Pakistan and create a force of Mujahideen, equip them with Stinger missiles and everything else to go after the Soviets inside Afghanistan. And we were successful. The Soviets left Afghanistan. And then we said, great, goodbye, leaving these trained people who were fanatical in Afghanistan and Pakistan, leaving them well armed, creating a mess, frankly, that uh, at the time, we didn't really recognize. We were just so happy to see the Soviet Union fall, and we thought, okay, fine, we're, we're okay now. Everything's going to be so much better. Now you look back, the people we're fighting today, we were supporting in the fight against the Soviets. This is what you see what a scumbag she is, because yes. she's fully knowledgeable of all yeah. the things. It's never a mistake. They it's all, all yeah. know exactly what they're doing. You don't think that she, her and Barack Obama knew that they were keeping the people in Haiti oppressed for corporate profits by giving them at 31 cents an hour? <laughs> this is the Jimmy Dore spot in which he was describing the problem of the Ukraine-Russia conflict, so-called, and the same form of a mistake being made with respect to the Azov Battalion and the Nazi forces in Ukraine. Uh, uh, people who've been following uh, uh, various elements of uh, uh, the work of the LaRouche organization uh, or its members and people also such as Helga Sepp LaRouche's work with the Schiller Institute know that 31 persons that have uh, participated in the conferences of the Schiller Institute or are on a Ukrainian kill list uh, that was issued by the Ukrainian Center for Countering Disinformation. Um, and that uh, from basically the end of July, uh, the Schiller Institute and the LaRouche organization and the others have been pointing out uh, the Nazi nature of of what is happening there and what's being supported by the United States there. But that's being denied in the same way that the Osama bin Laden business was denied. Speaking of that, we have a little uh, article uh, which will bring up a memory. This is from 1993. And that on the right, yes, is Osama bin Laden. And it says, uh, anti-Soviet warrior puts his army on the road to peace. And the uh, it begins, and then I've this little uh, excerpt here from the article. Osama bin Laden sat in his gold fringed robe, guarded by the loyal Arab Mujahideen who fought alongside him in Afghanistan. He is a shy man, maintaining a home in Khartoum and only a small apartment in his home city of Jeddah. He is married with four wives, but wary of the press. His interview with the London Independent, this is, the London Independent, was the first he has ever given to a Western journalist, and he initially refused to talk about Afghanistan. When the history of the Afghan resistance movement is written, Mr. Bin Laden's own contribution to the Mujahideen, can you, uh, flip, I'm, I'm reading from it, and the indirect result of his training and assistance may turn out to be a turning point in the recent history of militant fundamentalism. Within months, however, Mr. Bin Laden was sending Arab fighters, Egyptians, Algerians, Lebanese, Kuwaitis, Turks, and Tunisians into Afghanistan. Not hundreds, but thousands, he said. He supported them with his own, with weapons and his own construction equipment. So that's just to let people be clear about the relationship. And of course, the construction equipment refers to the fact of the bin laden construction company uh bin laden's father of course being a longtime associate of george bush 41 george george herbert, herbert walker bush and a personal friend of the family uh so you can see from that or remember from that uh the problem that we had uh which of course seems to have left three thousand plus people dead at the bottom of the world trade center whatever one thinks about the nature of what happened that day one cannot deny that the United States relationship with what was called the Mujahideen, starting from the time of particularly the summer of 1979 with Brzezinski's initiation of the war, uh, the holy war against the Soviet Union, uh, sometimes referred to later as Charlie Wilson's war and other things. No, you can't, you can't deny 
the degree to which, and as Hillary Clinton pointed out, United States involvement, catastrophic involvement, and then being involved in a 20 year war, which ended with the United States, of course, uh, and, uh, having the house of cards that it had established just crumble to the grounds, the house of cards of democracy. Uh, so now we have the same thing evolving right now in Ukraine, which of course, as everyone knows, would fall apart the moment that American money was no longer made available. Uh, in the Congress of the United States, we're beginning to hear a few voices that are speaking out concerning the question of the Ukraine, uh, the nature of the Ukraine regime, uh, and the reasons that we should not be involved in fighting a war against Russia, that is the United States and NATO should not be fighting a war in Russia that it calls the Ukraine conflict. It wasn't that long ago that some people in the Congress who seem to have forgotten this uh, had issued letters denouncing the Ukrainians as of battalion as fascist. This is uh, from something from then representative Max Rose, Congressman Max Rose. Uh, he said violent white supremacist groups meet all of the State Department criteria for inclusion on the list of foreign terrorist organizations, but for some reason, they refuse to label these groups as terrorists that they are, hampering law enforcement's ability to keep us safe. And he was referring specifically to the Azov uh, Brigade, the Azov Battalion, as you call them, and it's here in his letter. We have it there on the screen. For, as, for example, the Azov Battalion is a well-known ultra-nationalist militia organization in Ukraine that openly welcomes neo-Nazis into its ranks. And now, of course, is the declared, uh, uh, you know, uh, fiercely independent freedom fighters of Ukraine. So this um, business has extended into areas which should be just referenced again in or people are being reminded by us here today of their ignominious nature. Let's talk about the founder of the C-14, Tianibak, who was the uh, Ole Tianibak, uh, uh, and and uh, this is the youth wing of the Svoboda, Svoboda Party. Svoboda Party. He's there shaking hands with. Uh, oh, is that Joe Biden? Apparently, that is. He uses his right hand to shake hands with the president. And he uses his left hand to, oh, that's Tiani Buck, the founder of the C-14, the youth wing of the Svoboda Party, the man who you just saw shaking hands with Biden. Hmm. We want to say a little bit about C-14, and we decided in this case to go to a, the ever-reliable source, Wikipedia, just so that people would not... Uh, think we were either exaggerating or we were uh, being too uh, tough on the, our Ukrainian allies, or at least a portion of our Ukrainian allies. So C-14, 14 words, that's what 14 refers to. And this, these 14 words have two different iterations. The first is, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. That's the first iteration. And the derivative of that is because the beauty of the white Aryan woman must not perish from the earth. I think we'll refer to that as the Karen doctrine. Uh, but in any case, this is C-14. This is the youth wing of, of this Svoboda party. This is, uh, and we've talked about Azov Battalion. Everybody has heard about them. They recently visited the Congress. They got to see 100 people in the Congress to call for their support. And not one of those congressmen, at least as far as, as I know, to the best of our knowledge, denounce the, them or ask them about their Nazi roots or the fact that, for example, some of their uh, members were famously involved uh, in the Charlottesville uh, 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 incident, uh, which, of course, many left liberal types are always very upset about. So, so this tells us something about what the nature is, the uglier, wormy underside of the nature is of the American collaboration. This is who this is. This is the people that we are saying should be allowed to be entrusted to not only uh, have weapons and be supported uh, and comforted and, and uh, lauded by the United States, but we can even listen to the president of that country right now, Zelensky, call on the United States to use nuclear weapons against what he calls the terrorist state of Russia. 
Now, now that's kind of interesting because, of course, uh, you just saw that Max Rose's uh, uh, letter identified Azov Battalion as terrorist. Uh, but we should say something here concerning what the implications are of what Zelensky is talking about in terms of recent actions that have happened in the Congress, particularly in the Senate. Uh, there's something that was is, should be uh, referenced here called the Bush Doctrine. This is the um, change in posture that was uh, initiated in 2002 after the 9-11 attacks uh, ca uh, carried out ostensibly by the Mujahideen and, and enemies of the United States. Uh, and this is taken from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And it said, the Bush Doctrine affirms the legitimacy of a preventive strike and emphasizes the notion that, quote, if you are not with us, you are against us. U.S. foreign policy, therefore, is no longer just about containment or supporting freedom fighters, but about shedding the multilateralism favored by the Clinton administration. Is the Bush Doctrine a sound and effective strategy in the war on terror? Now, let's be clear. Containment was not containment of terrorists. Containment referred to containing the Soviet Union. And in a different way, also China, sometimes then back then called Red China, at least until the early 70s, uh, when after 1970, uh, between 72 and 79, policy on China began to shift. But, but nonetheless, this is important to say something concerning the issue of American nuclear posture and the fact that recently the, sen the Senate of the United States, the United States Senate voted unanimously on a sense of the Senate resolution, that is, it wasn't a binding law, but it was a sense of the Senate resolution in which the idea was that they would declare uh, Russia to be a terrorist organization. And that was, in fact, passed unanimously. Now, one has to understand that that implies something. And if we can go to the next, uh, next uh, illustration, I think I, I want to just uh, point something out, uh, if you have it there. Uh, Congressional Research Service, U.S. Nuclear Weapons Policy, Considering No First Use. Now, this has to do with whether or not the United States has agreed that you only use nuclear weapons in a defensive capacity. Well, that actually isn't the case. And what we're going to do is we're going to reference something from that Congressional Research Service document. And it says, since the end of the Cold War, the United States has modified its declaratory policy to reduce the apparent role of nuclear weapons in U.S. national security, but has not declared that it would not use them first. It's modified its declaratory policy to reduce the apparent role, but has not declared that it would not use them first. In the 2010 Nuclear Posture Review Report, the Obama administration stated that the United States, quote, would only consider the use of nuclear weapons in extreme circumstances and would not threaten or use nuclear weapons under any circumstances, quote, against non-nuclear weapon states that are party to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and in compliance with their nuclear non-proliferation ob obligations, so forth. But the administration was not prepared to state that the sole purpose of U.S. nuclear weapons was to deter nuclear attack because it could envision, quote, a narrow range of contingencies where nuclear weapons might play a role in deterring conventional chemical or biological attacks. Now, just want to point something out for people because this is just sort of a breaking story from the last 24 hours. Uh, TASS of Russia, uh, the news agency, reported uh, about a new NBC, CBS news item, which stated that the U.S. Army's 101st Airborne Division is ready to enter Ukraine in case of further tensions between Moscow and Kiev or an attack on a NATO member state. Now, let's be clear about what it is we're reporting to you here. We're saying that the Russians are trying to res are responding to something they've seen in a CBS news item. So they're not saying that we were informed that they as a nation were informed. They're talking about something that appeared in the newspapers. Um, and quote, in all about 4,700 soldiers from the 101st Airborne's home base in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, have been deployed to reinforce NATO's eastern flank. Um, 
and uh, and and it they otherwise it says the commanders told CBS News repeatedly that they are always quote ready to fight tonight while they're there to defend NATO territory if the fighting escalates or there's any attack on NATO they're fully prepared to cross the border into Ukraine well they're not just crossing the border into Ukraine they're crossing the border into thermonuclear war something just needs to be said here and this is the reason that we're going to be going for a minute here to t discuss the issue of the crisis of Great Britain although before we do that we have sort of a two-part presentation for you coming up we're in a, a zone in which the axioms uh, of the uh, old regime uh, the world the way it was are now over or the human race is over the multipolar rather the unipolar world concept that came about starting in what was called the 520 doctrine of 1990 first enunciated by Paul Wolfowitz Lewis Libby uh, and Dick Cheney's Defense Department uh, in the Bush uh, 41 regime that idea that the United States is the single hegemon of the world that is over or the human race is over now it's not to say we want to be very clear uh, that the United States is the author of that because the United States on the questions of strategic policy is rarely the author of anything the author the intellectual brain self-assigned by the way for the United States is usually perfidious Albion and perfidious Albion's uh, uh, colonial subjects uh, and chosen favorites and that includes various people whether that be people like Blinken or Samantha Power or uh, various other people Henry Kissinger of course famously back in May of 1982 spoke of himself as being closer to British intelligence during his as he called it his, his incarnation as Secretary of State uh, then he had been uh, to the State Department and, the, and to the United States in many occasions and so it's that which actually determines these policies and that's what we're going to spend quite a bit of time taking a look at that but before we do that uh we're going to have harley schlanger sort of set the stage for that discussion and then mike robinson will do what he does very well which is to take us into the the bowels of the machinery of the beast uh and then we'll go to questions and discussion so harley happy to see you especially since you're on that list <laughs> well, thank you, Dennis. Uh, I, I think that's a, a very adequate introduction to what I want to discuss, which is this concept of a world in transition. And it's not simple. I think the words we had from Lyndon LaRouche on this are important, that people tend to look for simple answers. And that's why they fall into these uh, traps that are set of left versus right, liberal versus conservatism, uh, socialist versus uh, Nazi. You know, that what's done is to divide people up in a way that they choose the, the, the way they choose an ice cream flavor, as opposed to engage in critical discussion. And the, the attempt to use censorship, uh, threats such as the Ukrainian uh, Committee to Com Combat Disinformation kill list, use threat to dampen any discussion. And we've been discussing this quite a bit because we're not going to be uh, silenced by it, but it's not so simple. And so you have to take a look at the situation from the heights that, that we're looking at a battle between two systems. And these are two systems and, and th that are one of which is going to come out on top in the very near future. And if the wrong one comes out on top, we may all be incinerated. So we're caught between two paradigms. And the, we, can, we can see it from the standpoint of the economy and also from the, the war danger, from the, the political side of things. But I'm going to be focusing primarily on the economy, where you look at what's happening as a result of inflation, the collapse of the physical economy, the debate between do we need quantitative tightening, that is high interest rates, or quantitative easing, more flow of, of volumes of liquidity. Are we facing debt defaults? Will tax cuts work? Uh, we saw this presented in, in the United Kingdom, and it became a mockery.
but I, I want to probably come back to this in the question and answer session because so many people believe the tax cuts in themselves will solve the problem because they believe that government is the problem. And they don't realize that it's not government per se. In fact, part of the problem is that government has been reduced in its power to regulate. And so this is another one of these axioms that has to be shattered. But the, the being caught between two paradigms, on the one hand, you have a collapsing financial system. You have a war that's being used to try to save it and a war in waiting in the Taiwan Strait. We have governments making decisions which go against the actual interests of their nation and their population. And as a result, we're seeing people rebelling. We're seeing demonstrations throughout Europe now growing in size. And we're seeing old alliances collapsing, political parties disintegrating. There's talk that the Tory party may be soon not just out of government, but out of business. Uh, another example of this is the Saudis. The Saudis' loyalty since they were created as, the, uh, as a Saudi Arabia has been to Great Britain and to the American oil companies. And yet we just saw the Saudis turn their back on Joe Biden and openly discuss joining the BRICS plus. So we're seeing this new paradigm emerge with these institutions such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Eurasian Economic Union, and of course the, the BRICS plus. And so I, I just want to quote uh, Putin on this because he put it most succinctly when he spoke in mid-September in Samarkand at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization conference. What he said then is, quote, Fundamental transformations are taking place in world politics and economics, and these are irreversible changes. And he went on to talk about the end of the unipolar order. Now, we know what the unipolar order is, and, and Putin has also been clear on this. But we've been attacking this before Putin ever brought it up. That's what Helga means when she says that she didn't need Putin to develop talking points for her. Lyndon LaRouche's talking points on these issues go back to the late 60s, early 1970s. But essentially, the unipolar order is one which, which rewards speculators and penalizes producers. And any nation that tries to break with that is a target nation for the uh, unipolar forces, which largely are U.S. military and NATO. Now, in between these two paradigms is a zone of instability. It, it's sort of like breaking the sound barrier where there's a brief moment where everything goes unstable and shaky. Now, the best way to see this is to take a case study. Look at the United Kingdom. Look at what's happened there in, in the, the last weeks. You have the second Tory prime minister ousted in a six month, uh, actually a, a two month period because Boris Johnson was kicked out just a little more than two months ago. And now Liz Truss is gone. And it was done in a very brutal way. And I wanna show you a brief clip of how this was handled in the prime minister's questions in the parliament. Jose, we have the clip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A book is being written about the Prime Minister's time in office. <laughs> Apparently, it's going to be out by Christmas. Is that the release date or the title? <laughs> Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I have been in office for just under two months, and I have delivered the energy price guarantee making sure that people aren't paying £6,000 bills this winter. I've reversed the national insurance increase and I've also taken steps, and we will be taking steps, to crack down on the militant unions. Yeah. Now what, what, Mr Speaker, I think, Mr Speaker, that is more of a record of action than the Honourable Gentleman in his two and a half years in the job. As I said, it's somewhat brutal. In a five-day period, she fired the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who is a dec decades-long collaborator of hers, Kwarteng, who wrote a book with her back in 2014 promoting the very policies 
that she was just booted out of office for trying to introduce. The, shortly after that, she was forced to leave. Now, anyone who thinks that Starmer, who is quite clever in his comments about Out by Christmas, that he might be an alternative, should realize that he's part of a, the, the prosecution of Julian Assange. And to make matters even more, in a sense, funny, almost like a Monty Python skit, it looks as though Boris Johnson is about to make a comeback. He's going to try to come back as the next prime minister. Now, what's the underlying issue here? It's this instability. It's the shift from a system that's breaking apart, a collapse, a, a, a situation in which populations are being threatened with no heat, no food, no money. And meanwhile, governments are being told that you have to increase the flow of money to what? To the speculators. Now, who do you blame for this? This is, and this goes back to the little clip we saw from Lyndon LaRouche. Well, Liz Truss tried to blame Putin. On her way out the door, she said, it's Putin who caused these things. Well, <laughs> let's, let's examine that. Who provoked the war? It wasn't Putin. It was eight years of NATO refusing to address legitimate security concerns raised very patiently by Vladimir Putin. Did Putin organize global derivative markets? Did he deregulate the Western economies so that derivatives transactions became the centerpiece of economic so-called growth? Did he insist on the green policy in the West? Did he put the sanctions on Russian oil? Did he blow up the, the North Sea, Nord Stream pipelines? Well, of course, he's accused of it. But if there had been any evidence of that, don't you think we would have seen it by now? Now, the, the war danger, in fact, has been exacerbated by the refusal to negotiate or engage in diplomacy. Who shut down negotiations? Was it Putin and Russia? No, there were negotiations moving ahead in March and April. It was Boris Johnson acting on behalf of his NATO and City of London masters who went to Kiev and told Zelensky, no negotiations with Putin whatsoever. Now, this has put us in an extremely dangerous situation because the, there's an escalation on the ground. The Ukrainian so-called offensive, which is largely still moving because of NATO money, NATO weapons, and as Dennis pointed out, perhaps NATO troops, is going to run into increasingly stiff opposition from Russia, especially as this, this call-up of troops begins to take effect and the Russians are continuing to rain down attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure. But the situation is worsened by the fact that there is no negotiation, no diplomacy. Anatoly Antonov, the Russian ambassador to the United States, told Newsweek that the structure of communications between Russia and the United States has been demolished, is the term he used. And the headline on the Newsweek article was, quote, Russian envoy to U.S. The channel that stopped nuclear war 60 years ago is dead, unquote. This is a reference to the back channel discussions that went on between the Soviet ambassador then, Anatoly Dobrynin, and Robert Kennedy, the brother of President John F. Kennedy, which led ultimately to a way out, an exit strategy from what otherwise looked like it was going to be a nuclear confrontation over Cuba. Now, is there a growing recognition among some people today that there is, that there's at this point no exit from the war? Well, this is where you see the instability playing out. There was a, an emergency meeting on Tuesday of this week, when, the, when Ben Wallace, the United Kingdom Defense Minister, flew to Washington in a hurry, had a meeting with Defense Secretary Austin and National Security Advisor Sullivan, and then hurried back to the United Kingdom, and had very little to say about what was discussed other than they discussed Ukraine. But within a couple of days, Lloyd Austin reached out to the uh, Russian Defense Minister Shoigu, 
and ask for a phone conversation, which they had. And the U.S. readout on it is that they discussed, quote, the importance of maintaining lines of communication, unquote. Precisely what Antonov said had been shut down. Now, is it because Austin is beginning to realize that there's a problem? Well, no. He said, we're continuing to support the Ukrainian forces. He made a call to Zelensky to uh, reiterate that. But then we're looking at the question of what's happening in the United Kingdom, which has been out front from the beginning in supporting the war in Ukraine. The Atlantic Council, in what they call their fast talking points, uh, when uh, Liz Truss resigned, raised a series of questions, which included, is this going to mean a change in the U.S.-British relationship, the special relationship? They asked, is the UK financial crisis going to force the British to back off from sending weapons and money to Ukraine? Now, I would say in the short term, hardly possible. They'd rather starve their population to keep the flow of weapons going than make that kind of shift. But if you look at the bigger picture in Europe, we're seeing tremendous change starting to emerge. The Financial Times, which is one of the uh, organs of uh, speaking for the city of London, had an article, European competitiveness facing an existential crisis. And what it's talking about is the deindustrialization, which is underway as a result of the economic policies and the green policies, the policies of the Great Reset and the policies to prevent the phony so-called man-made climate change problem. And they report that the aluminum uh, industry is being shut down systematically, cutbacks in steel production, because the electric arc furnaces, which are so crucial in, in steel production, are being closed due to the high cost of electricity. And you can go step by step, the collapse of the agricultural sector, the collapse of infrastructure in general. As this is unfolding, will they be forced to back away from war, especially especially if the populations are heard. And we're seeing some interesting developments on this. Let's start with the United States. The most important leading voice against this war and against these economic policies is a Senate candidate in New York State, Diane Sayre, who is stepping up everywhere she can on, on interviews, in campaign activity, posting billboards, uh, and has been the leading voice in challenging one of Biden's key co uh, uh, coordinators of this war policy, Chuck Schumer. Now, also the voice of Joel DeJean, who's a candidate for Congress in a district in Houston, whose slogan is nuclear power, not nuclear war. We're seeing shifts now in Germany. We even saw Greta Thunberg, who, by the way, is no great shakes on this, and quoting her just shows the, the way things change. She's now saying, well, nuclear energy is okay. Interesting, in Germany, we're seeing the emergence of someone who was virtually out of politics a few months ago, Sarah Wagenknecht, from the left party, the Linkspartei, who is now in a poll, the second most popular political figure in Germany, trailing behind not Olaf Scholz, not the Warhawk Greens of, of Baerbach and the, the uh, deindustrializer Habeck, but Soder, the minister president of Bavaria, who's a conservative from the Christian Social Union of the CDU, the conservative party. So we're seeing the emergence of a new coalition government in Italy. And whatever they're saying about that this is going to stick to the Ukraine situation, we'll see. There was a large demonstration in Rome last week, demonstration, very large demonstration in Paris, growing sentiment, which is seen in villages in eastern Germany, Belgium, and, and elsewhere. So added to the emergence of the SARE campaign as a spokesman for a different policy, we're seeing a panic emerging among the political leaders in the United States of a so-called red wave in November. That is Republicans taking the House, 
Republicans taking the Senate largely as a result of the completely incompetent policies of Joe Biden. But let's acknowledge something. Many of the Republicans are pro-war. As we've seen, a hundred senators, including all the Republicans, voted to declare Russia a terrorist state. So far, the money that's been flowing into Ukrainian arms is continuing, despite the fact that while we're sending 60 billion plus to Ukraine, and there's now talk of a post-election package of 50 billion more out of fear that if the Republicans take the House, they may move against the Ukraine war. What are we seeing? We're seeing votes for the war continuing. There are voices emerging largely because we're fighting this and we're, we're pulling together a coalition. But this is where the question of, of the people come in. As LaRouche said, simple solutions don't work. You have to go beyond the axioms of left, right, and, and so on. The developments in Europe show that this could be happening, even here in Germany. But what will happen in the United States? The reason we have these discussions, including more conferences, one coming up on October 27th. We just had the conference, the Schiller International Youth Conference a week ago. We're doing this because it's necessary for people to develop their critical faculties, to think, to think beyond the simple uh, slogans like America first. And that's where Schiller comes in. The importance that Schiller ascribed to being a patriot, he said, one should be a patriot of one's own country, but at the same time, a world citizen. The two are not mutually antagonistic. And this is the point that Helga Zepp LaRouche has been making. Our mission is to bring the United States into an agreement with the other three major powers, Russia, India, and China, to fight against the neocons and the neoliberals of Wall Street and the city of London, who are responsible for what otherwise is a civilizational crisis that has only one way out, and that is to establish a new security architecture and a new financial architecture based on the principles of physical economy of Lyndon LaRouche. Thank you, Harley. And now we will go to Mike Robinson, who, uh, you know, Lyndon LaRouche was talking at the beginning of the program about the idea of the axioms and holding on to axiomatic beliefs as tragedy. What we've seen in Britain in the last week or so is more sort of like the old sort, uh, series, Yes Minister, or Yes Prime Minister. And uh, yeah, there's tragedy, but certainly there, that, that sort of vicious uh, British humor would seem to be more on display than anything in the hapless Liz Truss being sort of trussed up and thrown out. Uh, but but I think Mike, uh, and he's been here many times, he's from UK Column, uh, and he uh, has some things to say, not just about Britain, of course, but about sort of what this, what, what, what this actually means for the world situation, for the transatlantic situation. It's always a pleasure to have him here. We always learn uh, something from him, usually things that people don't want to know. Uh, and that's always good. So, Mike, uh, do as much as as little as you want. You're already getting questions, by the way. They've already begun to come into the queue. So, even before you've said yeah, anything, good, <clears throat> good stuff. Uh, well, tragedy. It is tragic. It is tragic what has happened in the last uh, two or three months, in particular. Uh, we shouldn't forget why Boris was thrown out of his job. He was thrown out of his job because uh, he broke uh, his own uh, COVID lockdown rules. He held some parties. Uh, when everybody else was unable to do that. Uh, and he eventually, uh, on top of the parties, of course, he then subsequently lied about the fact that he had, uh, he had, had held the parties. And so that, that effectively made his position uh, no longer credible. The Tory party held a leadership election um, and it finally came down to two people. One was Rishi Sunak and the other was Liz Truss. Um, and... Although it was no surprise, in fact, uh, right at the very beginning of this process, uh, I had suggested that Liz Truss was likely to be the winner. I can't remember why I thought that at the time, but, but that, that was the case. But she has historically 
had um, or demonstrated a level of incompetence and a level of uh, inability to deliver a, a narrative, a political narrative that just did not seem like it was going to end very well. And it seemed that if she was selected for leader, as she eventually was, uh, that it would end in tears. Now, uh, of course, uh, only a matter of weeks before she became leader, she had been foreign secretary and she had decided that the best thing that any uh, British uh, former soldiers or veterans could the best thing they could do would be to head off to Ukraine and get involved in in the fighting in Ukraine. Uh, she had to backtrack from that statement, uh, but that was a, a very uh, pivotal statement at a very pivotal point at the very beginning of the war. So um, on Thursday, then uh, this was the the sad scene uh, as she came out smiling uh, to issue her tender her resignation um and uh it was a, a, <laughs> the end of as harley said a fairly brutal time for her uh and uh what was really quite incredible about it was that she was absolutely unable to answer a question that was put to her so over the i mean even the utterly controlled uh mainstream media that we have in the uk that is utterly reliant these days on government funding for its very existence uh, was unable to to keep its um, mirth and its uh, skepticism and its uh, uh, ab absolute outright aggression towards her quiet um, and so uh, and this was because that sh she was not able to answer a question and in fact I would say that and I don't think it's being terribly unfair to say this but I would say that she was at least as incompetent as Joe Biden, but she didn't have she didn't have the uh, excuse of age uh, to justify the, the the inability to actually think. Um, so as a result, then uh, after she left on Thursday, we had the likes of this tweet coming out from Dmitry Medvedev: "Bye bye, Liz Truss. Congrats to Lettuce." Uh, we'll explain that. I'm sure everybody knows about the lettuce, but if you don't, we'll explain it in a second. But of course. Uh, Liz Truss had completely demolished any reputation that she had within the Russia, with the Russians uh, whenever she met uh, Sergei Lavrov. And, uh, well, in fact, a number of statements that she made because she absolutely demonstrated, first of all, that she had no understanding of history and also no understanding of geography. And as a foreign secretary, this is never a good thing. Uh, but so what is the uh, lettuce reference here? Well, unfortunately, it's literally a lettuce because a tabloid uh, newspaper in the UK called the Daily Star decided that they would create a live stream and they literally set a camera. They bought a lettuce from a supermarket. They set a camera up in front of the lettuce and they asked the question, would the lettuce die before Liz Truss uh, <laughs> lost her job? And unfortunately, uh, the lettuce lived longer than she did in the role. So uh, really, it has been quite a brutal time for her. I think she suffered greatly as a result. She didn't do very well at all. Now, as Harley said, how did this all happen? Well, she appointed Kwasi Kwarteng as the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer. This is our uh, finance minister. Uh, and he created what he described as a mini budget. Uh, and what happened there was that what the, the procedure in this country is that uh, chancellors are expected to take advice from uh, two main non-governmental organisations. One is the Bank of England, but the other is uh, a body called the Office for Budget Responsibility, and it is there to uh, supposedly independently decide whether a budget is actually uh, affordable for the country. Um, and, uh, and neither of those two uh, institutions were asked about the, the uh, budget before it was given, and what's more, the uh, government was actually uh, agitating or briefing against both those institutions and this started a huge fight not only from uh, other politicians but uh, more broadly in the media. Uh, Quasi Quarteng's uh, budget failed as uh, because the markets reacted in a particular way. Uh, the pound uh, sank to its knees and government debt became extremely expensive very quickly um, and uh, so then we, uh, she had to, was forced to replace, she was forced to sack Quasi Quartang and she appointed uh, Jeremy Hunt. Uh, here he is. 
uh, very wide-eyed, uh, and he is indeed wide-eyed. Uh, Jeremy Hunt then did, reversed everything. So we will reverse almost all the tax measures announced at the growth plan three weeks ago that have not started parliamentary legislation. Uh, we'll continue with the abolition of health and social care levy and stamp duty changes as a, a tax on buying houses. They're, they've made a change to, to reduce the level of tax on, on buying houses. Uh, off payroll work, working reforms, uh, the new VAT free and so on, uh, you can read that. Uh, and then he said that a treasury led review will take place on how uh, people are to be helped with energy bills from April next year. And, and this was the final nail in the coffin really because Liz Truss had put all her eggs in one basket and that was uh, her protection of uh, the ordinary man in the street from energy bills and she had said she was going to make sure that people were not subject to massive energy bills for a period of two years but taking all that into account taking the mini budget and her energy plan into account it was going to cost the uk hundreds literally hundreds of billions of pounds uh, which uh, the uk was uh, absolutely unable to afford now if we just uh, just quickly explain the energy cap um Obviously, in the UK, we pay energy per unit of gas or electricity, um, and the, on average, people are perceived to use a, a certain amount of energy per year. Um, and if uh, the, the uh, regulator puts a cap on the maximum amount of money that the energy companies can, can, can charge a consumer per unit, uh, and that meant the following. Uh, so that meant that the cap in April of 2022 meant that for the average household, their energy bill was not likely to be more than £1,971 per year. Now, that cap used to be reviewed every six months. And then in April this year, they decided to change that to be every three months uh, because energy companies were being uh, heavily affected by the uh, wholesale cost of energy. So the next three three months, uh, sorry, six months came up in in, in uh, October, uh, and the they decided that the energy cap should rise to three thousand five hundred and fifty pounds in October uh, for the average household. That's not a maximum that everybody pays. That's just if you use the average amount of energy. Uh, and so what Liz Truss had said was, well, no, that's too expensive for most people. So uh, what we'll do is we'll draw a line down here at the two and a half thousand pound mark uh, and that households will have to pay on average two and a half thousand pounds for their for their energy but the government will pick up the tab for everything to the right hand side of that blue line um, so the government in, in if the uh, price cap in october was three thousand five hundred uh, was three thousand five hundred and fifty pounds then basically the government was going to be paying a thousand fifty pounds of that but then if we look in the projections for next year uh, in january the projection is that uh, the uh, average household will be paying £5,405 per, uh, per year by January, and then in April, £7,263. Uh, then the government was going to be paying everything, you know, that part of the bill that appears to the right-hand side of that line. This is going to cost, uh, best estimates, £150 billion for the first six months. Um, and uh, this was her biggest plan. Um, so what uh, has happened now is that uh, Jeremy Hunt has decided that, in fact, they're not going to pay for this any further than April 2023. So by uh, July, from, from April, well, effectively, if we put that back on screen, uh, what that means is that uh, in, on the 31st, on the, sorry, the 30th of March uh, 2023, uh, the average household will be paying two and a half thousand pounds a year. Uh, but on the 1st of April, that could if these projections are correct, uh, jump to £7,000. That is a significant difference in uh, energy price uh, that people are going to have to pay. Uh, and unfortunately, she failed to, uh, to keep that, uh, well, unfortunately for, for households, she failed to keep that, uh, that uh, policy in place. So that was only one part of the, of the uh, bailout of the energy companies, though, because there was another... Uh, uh, part of this. Um, so just before we get to that, though, let's put, just put Jeremy Hunt back on, on uh, screen. He's saying that uh, not only households will get support in terms of energy costs, but businesses will get support in terms of energy costs as well. 
Uh, it's interesting that he used this line, which he said, business support will go to those most affected and will incentivize energy efficiency. And if we go back a couple of years to what Mark Carney said, he was making the point that if companies that don't adapt, including companies in the financial system, will go bankrupt without question. So, so what uh, Jeremy has, just a slight aside here, what Jeremy Hunt is saying there is he's basically uh, voicing this policy. When, when Carney was saying companies that don't adapt, he meant that companies that don't adapt to the Green New Deal to reduce their energy consumption. Um, and so basically what uh, the policy is as far as protection of, of businesses goes, uh, it, it means that, that only businesses that are reducing their energy consumption will get any government support uh, in the next uh, period of time uh, and so on. So uh, anyway, Liz was forced to go and now we have a... Uh, new leadership election taking place. And, uh, well, as Harley said, there is a possibility that Boris is going to end up uh, back in the job of Prime Minister. Now, can he actually pull this off? Well, first of all, he still hasn't uh, ever been taken to task for the, f the reason that he was uh, thrown out of the job in the first place. Um, in order to uh, become Prime Minister again, he would have to win a leadership contest, which is going to happen very quickly. It's going to, uh, the result will be announced within a week. Um, the candidates, anybody that's going to stand for this leadership uh, election, have to declare by uh, Monday at 2 p.m. UK time. Uh, and in order to declare as a candidate, they've got to have at least the support of 100 uh, Tory MPs uh, and uh, by that 2 p.m. deadline. Uh, now, Rishi Sunak, who was uh, Liz Truss's uh, final rival for, uh, back at the, at the most recent leadership election, has reached that target. Boris claims he's reached that target. There's some doubt about that. Uh, and the other candidate, potential candidate is, is Penny Mordaunt, uh, and uh, she, I believe, is not quite there yet. Uh, now, Boris uh, flew back to the UK yesterday because he had been in the United States on a speaking tour. I think he was earning $130,000 per speech uh, for that tour, but he rushed back. He dropped that, uh, that speaking tour, rushed back for this, uh, for this opportunity to become uh, Prime Minister again. So that must have been very exciting for him. Um, <clears throat> now, so Monday... Uh, they have to decide, and then by Friday we'll know who the next uh, Prime Minister is going to be. I don't think I'm going to make a prediction this time. It could very well be uh, Boris, because uh, he, I think the Tory party feel that they need uh, someone with that kind of charisma or something. I don't know. The, the truth is that if, the, if, if uh, the Labour Party were to force a general election at this point, the current polls are suggesting... Uh, that the Tory party would receive only 17% of the vote. Uh, and if that was the case, as Harley says, that would effectively be the end of them. Uh, the question then is, uh, where, what, what is the situation with respect to uh, the opposition? Where would, where would we... Uh, I'm just going to try and find uh, what I've got here on, yes, uh, Mr. Starmer. Because the question is, would there be... If, the, if a general election was called and undoubtedly Labour would win that, uh, that general election, would that really make any difference uh, to policy? And who is Keir Starmer anyway? Uh, Harley alluded to one part of his uh, history. He is Sir Keir Starmer because he was uh, head of the Department for Public Prosecutions uh, at some point. So he was running uh, all the prosecutions, running the organisation that manages prosecutions, criminal prosecutions in the UK. Um, but I just thought I would put up this. If you want somebody, anybody wants a little bit of background on them, just put up this article in, from the Grey Zone. Um, they're asking five questions, or they were in 2020, asking five questions for the new Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer. I'll just run through what the questions were very quickly. Uh, the first one was, why did you meet with MI5 chief for social drinks the year after you decided not to prosecute MI5 for his role in torture? Uh, the second question was when and when, why, when and why did you join the Trilateral Commission? Uh, the third one was what did you discuss with U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder when you met him on, December, on November 9th, 2001 in Washington, D.C.? Uh, there was some question over expenses and so on, but he didn't actually declare what the discussion was about. Um, what role did you play in, this, in the Crime Prosecution Service's 
uh, irregular handling of the Julian Assange case, as uh, Harley alluded to earlier. Uh, and the fifth question is, why did you develop such a close relationship with the Times newspaper where the director of, uh, while you were director of public prosecutions, and does that close relationship still exist? Uh, now, one question they don't ask was uh, what his involvement was uh, in the non-prosecution of uh, Jimmy Savile, who was uh, one of the most uh, egregious uh, paedophiles and necrophiliacs in the UK, a very well-known uh, public figure in the UK, a personal friend of uh, Prince Charles when he was Prince Charles. Uh, he's, he's dead now, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, Starmer was allegedly in, involved in the decision not to prosecute uh, Jimmy Savile at the time. So uh, a lot of questions uh, to be asked about him and would the policy with respect to Ukraine, for example, change if he were to become prime minister? No. Um, so it looks like the Tory strategy at this point, because they have the, the reputation is so shot, is to uh, simply uh, try to limp through the next two years until they're forced uh, to call a general election in the hope that uh, something should happen in the meantime that could possibly bail them out of this situation. Um, now, uh, Harley mentioned there um, that the British government prefer to starve uh, the British people than to uh, see um, the Ukraine not receive uh, its continued supply of weapons. That is true. Um, and uh, we know it's true because, for example, uh, Ben Wallace, the Secretary of State for Defence, uh, threatened to resign uh, if there was any reduction in, in uh, uh, Jeremy Hunt's uh, revision of the budget in the defence budget. So, so uh, Ben Wallace had been promised significantly raised defence budget uh, and uh, so he was absolutely going to make sure that, that there was no further reduction of that. Um, Harley also mentioned the reduction in steel uh, and the shutting down of, of uh, uh, smelters and so on as a result of the cost of energy. It's ironically not just steel in the UK. Um, in fact, uh, the UK who <coughs> excuse me, claims to be um, pushing the Green New Deal as hard as it can uh, is finding that um, battery factories, uh, because we are supposedly at the forefront of uh, developing new battery technology and so on for electric vehicles and whatnot, uh, but uh, many of these, uh, uh, or a number of these t uh, new battery plants uh, are either being postponed in terms of their development or being shut down as a result of uh, energy prices as well. So there's a little bit of irony in that. Uh, and then just to, to end uh, on this, I just wanted to remind everybody the the legislative program that is that is going on uh, at the moment uh, in the UK. And again, this legislative program wouldn't change as a result of a change of government. It certainly won't change as a, if as a result of a uh, change of Tory prime minister, but it won't change either as a result of uh, if there should be a general election and a change of government. Um, and I just want to make a couple of points about this, just to remind everybody uh, the attack on uh, British people by the government at the moment. So the shutdown and free speech continues. The online safety bill that we've talked about on this uh, on this uh, program before um, is absolutely right back at the forefront. It still hasn't passed, thankfully, uh, but it is as soon as uh, any stability comes to Parliament, uh, the first thing on the agenda. Um, we have uh, a national security bill and a counter state threats bill, which is going to have a chilling effect on on uh, <clears throat> uh, investigative journalists in particular. Protest. Uh, the media has been full of uh, headlines in the last few weeks in the UK over protests by an organization called Just Stop Oil, which is a, a, a an offshoot of Extinction Rebellion or related in some way. Um, and they are uh, being quite... Uh, uh, running some quite uh, brutal uh, shutdowns of streets and, and so on. They're not lighting, allowing ambulances through and this kind of thing, which is creating all kinds of furore in the media, uh, which is uh, creating the justification for the criminalization of protest and all protests will be criminalized. Now, we've already got the Police, Crime, Courts and Sentencing Act, which I've talked about on this program before, but we've got a new piece of legislation coming called the uh, Public Order Bill, 
Um, then we've got the elections bill, which uh, removes the independence of the election, the electoral commission, uh, and so we have a problem with free and fair elections. Uh, unaccountable to law, the judicial review bill uh, continues, and that this means that the government can't be taken to court uh, and through a process called judicial review, uh, have a judge make a uh, ju uh, judgment on uh, the, le the legality of, of, gov of government uh, legislation and so on. Uh, rights removed, we've got a new Bill of Rights coming. Uh, the National uh, Nationality and Borders Bill has the potential to strip citizenship uh, and the Schools Bill um, absolutely puts... Uh, we're also, we, we have a, a national curriculum at the moment, which is a framework for schools. Schools have a lot of flexibility over how that gets implemented. Uh, that is being ended in the Schools Bill and uh, basically the government uh, will dictate to schools how, what and when uh, topics are are taught in schools and so on. So uh, th things uh, continue to rumble on in this country. We have had uh, some entertainment in the last couple of weeks, as Harley says, with some brutal uh, uh, behaviour on, on the part of so-called opposition uh, MPs uh, and the removal of a prime minister. Uh, but uh, we will see who it is that comes to replace Liz. Uh, if it's Boris, well, we know what we're getting there. If it's Rishi Sunak, uh, probably we'll get something much the same. It may not have the charisma of Boris, but it'll be much the same. So there we go. All right. So, uh, okay, Mike, well, thank you very much. As I said, there's already several questions coming in. What I want to do first is ask Harley when he, whether he's got any comment on what you've presented. Well, I, I very much appreciate Mike's uh, report because it, it does confirm what, what we've been looking at. And the, the question here is one thing that's been clear from, for us in the LaRouche movement uh, throughout our history is the role of the British. And by British, we don't mean the English people because the people are victims of this policy also. But the network of lords and would-be masters of the universe from the city of London who put their interests ahead of not only the people of, of Britain, but of the people of the world. And this is where you, you have to address this question of a new financial architecture. The, both the, the policy of trust, which everyone is now saying, oh, is such a disaster, is just a step beyond, a small step beyond what is the traditional policy of the previous governments. Namely, speculators come first. The stability of the banking system comes first, and the banking system is part of the process, the financial system, the hedge funds, and so on, part of the process of pushing the Green New Deal, the deindustrialization, from the new king, Charles, all the way down through the, the lords and others. So I, I think Mike gave us a, a very good sense that you know, while the people of Great Britain clearly want change, or maybe let's just say a significant growing portion of them want change, it's not going to come through the political system, at least at this point. All right. So, uh, Mike, there are various questions. One thing I just want to uh, make sure that you do, uh, because I think people are not clear that I think, uh, well, and, and there's a question that pertains to this. So let me just actually uh, indicate the question. Uh, and the question to you is, is there any chance for Jeremy Corbyn or someone like him to rise to prime minister amidst all this turmoil in the UK? Now, uh, before you answer, I'd like you to sort of to give people a sense that what we're dealing with here is that the Tory party is in power. There's nothing like a democratic process of the type that, you know, is thought about in the United States that is capable of happening here under the present configuration, as I understand it. But why don't you, in the course of answering the question, sort of give people a, a lesson in British parliamentary democracy? Uh, right. Well, before I do that, I'll just mention, Harley said uh, speculators come first. That's true. The one thing I didn't mention there, because it wasn't actually part of the announcement, was, uh, of course, Liz Truss had decided to remove uh, the 
limit on bankers' bonuses in the City of London, uh, and that was not reinstated. So, so bankers are now uh, free to earn, uh, to earn, <laughs> to uh, be given uh, unlimited bonuses uh, as as uh, as their employers see fit. Uh, but anyway, uh, okay, parliamentary. Uh, let's see, where do we start with this? So. We don't have a presidential system the way you do. Uh, we, uh, when, at, at a general election time, uh, each of the political parties, uh, and this, uh, the two main political parties are the, the Conservative Party, the Tories, and the Labour Party, uh, publish a manifesto which is basically lays out their plans for what they would do if they, once, if they were to form the next government. And people are really supposed to be voting on, on that. Now, particularly since Tony Blair, uh, because he... he uh, attempted to change things to become a bit more uh, sort of presidential in style. It became a bit more about who was the leader of the party and so on. Uh, but that's that's not really how things are supposed to work in in the UK. And that's why, uh, just because there has been a change in leader of the Tory party and therefore a change of prime minister, uh, that there isn't necessarily a general election. Uh, and so it is the case then that there isn't really anything anybody can do to force uh, a general election at this time. Uh, so the Labour Party can't really do anything uh, to force a general election. Um, they have to wait for the incumbent administration to decide that they will hold one. Now, uh, in 2010, there was a, a piece of legislation pushed through called the uh, Fixed Term Parliaments Act, which said that, that a parliament will last for five years. Uh, and uh, but, but that was repealed uh, a year or two ago, uh, and so we're back in the situation where it's up to the prime minister of the de of the day to decide when is the most advantageous. He get, he's entitled to decide when's the most advantageous time to hold a general election, and he gets to choose. There is a limit on that, so so I think I think the uh, the the uh, next election can't happen any time later than uh, May. 2025, I think, or 2024, 2024, I think it is. Um, so there's a limit on it, but it, but basically, uh, the the sitting prime minister can choose to hold an election, uh, a general election, at any time up to that point. But in a situ situation like this, there's really nothing anybody can do other than to uh, uh, call for it, uh, to to force uh, any prime minister to to hold a general election. Does that answer that question? I think it unfortunately does, and I think uh, there's more. <laughs> there's more that we would be able to say about it. Uh, Harley, I'm going to go to you for a minute. There's actually two questions which are fairly close, two different individuals. Uh, one is asking, can the Saudis be trusted by the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and the South Africa? And the second is, do you think Turkey will join the BRICS? So you probably want to explain, Harley, what that is and then what the nature of the questions are. Sure. Well, the, the BRICS uh, is the coalition that was created with uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa as an alternative to the existing unipolar order, where they coordinated economic policy uh, to some extent, security policy. Uh, but primarily, the, the driver for this is the Belt and Road Initiative and, and the agreement that there should be mutually beneficial economic cooperation among nations. Now, this is, initially, it was somewhat poo-pooed by the Western establishment. But as China continued to grow as a factor in the world economy, it became the subject of uh, deep anxiety. And then especially when the China-Russia relationship consolidated uh, as recently as the February 4th, 2022 meeting, uh, where they signed a series of agreements. And now since the war in Ukraine, the NATO war to destroy Russia, has caused a number of nations that were watching this to jump in on the side of Russia and China, if not openly supporting them, at least refusing to go along with the sanctions policy against Russia. Now, what we're seeing is nations are reacting to what they know is the intent of the Great Reset and the Green New Deal, 
which is to uh, prevent them from having any sense of sovereign activity. That is to take away their sovereignty, to say to nations, you must obey the rules of the rules-based order. And there's only one economic model, and that's the free market neoliberal model, which is the model of, of Washington and, and London and Brussels. Now, we're seeing a total reaction against that because that model is a new form of colonialism, but it's coming about at a time where you have inflation, where you have food shortages, and where we've seen 20 years of nonstop wars, not just by the United States, but by NATO. I mean, don't forget, NATO was involved in Iraq. NATO was involved in Libya. The French are involved in all kinds of operations in Africa. Uh, the British are involved in all of these, going back to the crisis with uh, Serbia and Yugoslavia in the 1990s. So countries around the world are, are looking at this and they're saying, well, are we willing to sacrifice our people and our nation to be in on the good side of this unipolar order? And especially when they're seeing the unipolar order collapsing internally and now being challenged militarily by Russia. And Russia is not doing this to deliberately to challenge them, but Russia is saying, we will defend our national sovereignty and our security. And so this is emboldened other nations. Now, you know, it's hard to know what, what the Saudis will do. You know, Biden, on the one hand, made some offers to the Saudis. On the other hand, he talked tough about the, the Khashoggi case. Uh, but most recently, Biden went to Saudi Arabia and said, you got to help us. We need some oil. And what is usually not reported is that the Saudis are producing a lot of oil. But there's the, the demand for oil. It's, it's a mixed situation because as the economies are contracting, the amount of energy is decreasing in, in some of these countries. And the Saudis are looking at this. And they're looking at what they get from a relationship with the United States and Britain. And, you know, they're, they're, the, the, maybe they're doing a gamble or something in thinking it would be better to put our lot in with the other nations of the South and work with the BRICS. So recently, uh, Mohammed bin Salman was talking with, uh, I believe, uh, the offer came from the president of South Africa. Uh, Erdogan has been interested in this, and Erdogan is very much a, uh, becoming a partner of Russia on the remaining pipelines of pro providing energy to Europe. So this is part of the transition. Now, is this a threat to the United States and Britain that these countries work together on these projects? Is it a threat if people are pulled out of poverty in, in China and by Chinese investment in Africa. Why is that a threat? Well, it's a threat because it means these countries are asserting their sovereignty, which means they're not going to accept economic policies which underprice their raw materials and underprice their labor for the benefit of global corporations and corporate cartels. And so it's the corporate cartels and the financial institutions that are driving the policy of, of the war against Russia to make sure that Russia cannot stand up to the unipolar order. And this is something that people generally don't understand, that the war in Ukraine is really not about freedom and sovereignty and democracy in Ukraine, because there's no democracy in Ukraine. And if anyone concerned themselves with sovereignty for Ukraine, they should ask the question of, who supported the overthrow of the democratically elected Yanukovych government? It was the West. Where was their support for Ukrainian sovereignty? Where was their support for the people of Ukraine when they sent the International Monetary Fund in to escalate the looting? Where is Zelensky's commitment to his people when he's selling off the prime Ukrainian farmland to swindlers like BlackRock and, and the... Uh, raw material, I'm sorry, the, the grain cartel companies, and, and, and so on, Cargill and, and the, the like. So this is where the axioms have to be broken, and where we're seeing countries around the world that had been somewhat silent for a long time, 
standing up now saying, we want to be with the BRICS. And it's Argentina is one of them. We're watching a process unfold in South America, uh, throughout Africa. And that's why Putin is right. And LaRouche before that was right, that we are in a transition period of a dramatically changing world. Okay, Mike, here's a question from Angela, and she asks, is it possible that Boris Johnson deliberately escalated the war in Ukraine in order to see the breakup of the EU since, Bre and since as since Brexit, his economy had been suffering? In other words, the idea is, okay, Brexit's happened and Britain was a problem, and did Boris Johnson escalate the war sort of as an attack uh, on Europe? I think that's her idea. Uh, no, I don't think I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, and I think that uh, um, uh, Boris uh, and the Conservative government have been, um, although they, I think they were quite surprised whenever the 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 uh, result um, of the Brexit referendum came out. In many ways, I mean, Boris uh, was never particularly. Uh, he stood uh, during the Brexit, ref obviously in the lead up to the referendum, on, on a campaign which was pro-Brexit. But, but my honest opinion is that he was there to try and manage that campaign and try to, to uh, uh, end up with a, with a result which, which was pretty much in line with what David Cameron had wanted to see uh, ahead of time. So David Cameron, if, if we think back to to that point had published a document called The Best of Both Worlds, where he was attempting to, to, to uh, take, a, take the UK out of some of the EU institutions that, that were really the most controversial ones, like the European Court of Justice and so on, uh, but maintain the UK within the this, this single market. Um, and I'm very skeptical, very skeptical about whether Boris is actually uh, anti-European in any way. I think he, I think he was there to try to try to manage the Brexit campaign and try to make sure that it sort of uh, didn't gain uh, the the tr level of traction that perhaps it otherwise would have. Uh, anyway, the the vote was fairly close, and uh, and the vote was to leave, and therefore Cameron lost his job as uh, as Prime Minister at the time, or he resigned at that point, and that started this whole journey then to the point that we're at uh, today. But we've got to remember that. Uh, all the way through that process, um, Britain has very quietly, with no fanfare in the media, no discussion in the media, uh, Britain has been uh, helping the uh, structures, the, the European defence structures, for example, and how, how is that going to work with NATO and, and so on, um, and try to maintain the transatlantic relationship while that European defence uh, uh, structure is built. Um, and in fact, Liz Truss just two weeks ago uh, was uh, over at uh, in Prague for I can't sorry Harley, you're going to have to remind me what the name of the the, the new European uh, body is called. But this is uh, a European body that's uh, that's been uh, notionally set up by by Macron. And at that meeting, um, they they voted that the UK should be permitted to uh, enter into European defence. Uh, uh, operations uh, under the guise of, of the permanent structured cooperation, as it's called. Um, so, you know, Liz Truss certainly was very quietly, it never appeared in the UK media at all, uh, brought us into those, uh, into those structures. Uh, so so I, I don't really think that the Tory government, uh, whether it be Boris Johnson or Liz Truss or David Cameron or Theresa May, it's certainly not Theresa May, uh, ever really wanted to see uh, th this Kind of uh, hard Brexit that that uh, everybody's talking about, um, and uh, and the, the the question in my mind still is, how hard is the Brexit that we have? Because for example, if you ask um, a farmer in Northern Ireland uh, whether there is such a thing as Brexit, he will say no. So we so in fact uh, Brexit isn't <laughs> isn't even quite what it seems uh, if you only read the newspapers. Yeah, I think you're referring to the European political community. I think that's what... Uh, that's Macron. that's the one, yes. Thank you. Yes. Dennis, let, if I could say something sure. about that, because I think it's an sure. important question. The idea that Boris Johnson is anti-European or that the uh, operation is anti-European, 
Yes, it is. But this is not Boris Johnson. This is British policy going back to the end of the 19th century. And in particular, it's anti-German. And it, it's anti-German for fear that if Germany and Russia work together, it would obliterate the, the power structure which enabled the British Empire to continue. And this, this gets to a question that I get from all the time from people. What do you mean the British Empire? There's no more British Empire. There is a British Empire. It's an empire that exists in a, in a different form than in the 19th century under Queen Victoria and in the 20th century. But the empire is run out of London, and it's run as a joint, uh, what you might call a hybrid warfare capability of the Five Eyes network, which includes primarily the United States and Britain, the so-called special relationship. And that special relationship controls NATO. NATO is a, you know, it pretty much has been toothless uh, and without the United States and the, the British military. And the, the fear of those who run this city of London Wall Street empire is that if Germany were to increase its trade and integration with Russia and China, integration with the Eurasian perspective, that it would weaken and ultimately force a, a dramatic change worldwide, including the demise of the United States and the, the British, unless they were to go along with this new paradigm. So in that sense, what Johnson represents is this historic British anti-German and anti-Russian policy. And I, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind that there were two moments where this could have changed. One was the Rapallo Treaty a hundred years ago, where the Germans and the Russians signed an agreement to break out of the control of the Versailles Treaty and the architect of that from Germany, Walter Rottenau, was assassinated within two months after signing the agreement. And then again in 1989, when the whole question came up of what would be the nature of the post-Soviet period, and there were people in Germany representing industry and, and sensible bankers, such as Alfred Herrhausen, who were orienting toward a proposal very similar to that presented by Lyndon and Helga LaRouche, Herrhausen was assassinated, and, and as were several others. So I think that the antagonism toward Germany and Russia stems from this fear that the special status internationally of the city of London would be lost if there were a, an alliance, an economic alliance, that would unify the integrated nations of, of the Eurasian area China, uh, the Pacific, with European countries. And we, we see it again. What happened with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline? It was blown up. Is that in the interest of Germany, in the interest of Russia? No, obviously not. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, Harley. Uh, can I just, sorry, can I just, can I just add something to that? Uh, yeah, so just to, just to clarify, I, I completely agree with what you've just said there, Harley. I mean, uh, if we think about, I mean, Dennis mentioned Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, uh, the, the British uh, comedy sitcom. Uh, one of the early episodes, uh, the, the civil servant was, uh, was explaining to the politician uh, why Britain is in Europe, and, it's, and, and he was absolutely uh, making the point. It was there to create trouble and keep everybody at each other's throats and so on, the, the divide and conquer policy. When, I was talk, when I'm talking about uh, pro-Europe and anti-Europe, uh, yeah. That what we're talking about with the pro-Europeans, uh, the, the British pro-European policy is about uh, um, uh, actually getting in there and stirring things up and breaking out, breaking everything yeah. apart, just as you're as you're you're suggesting there. Just just wanted to make that uh, that point. Well, I wasn't speaking in opposition to what you said, but I'm trying to address no, I, the I, I, axioms yeah. that most people have that they don't understand these things. Right. Uh, yeah, and and we well, well okay. So 
<laughs> we can discuss let yes minister a bit <laughs> because those who have not seen it should watch it in order to understand what actually happened to Liz Truss, who was unable to see the drama in which she was the lead character, even as it unfolded yeah. before her eyes. Uh, and, and, and that's one of the more important things about the sort of deceptiveness of the upfront people. You know, we're discussing upfront people at the moment. But actually, the processes that are uh, operating are, are operating at, at, a, at a deeper level. Um, uh, Harley, actually, uh, we have a question for you. But before we go to the question, let me just bring something up. Uh, Jose, if you could put up that graphic for a moment, because I'd like to reference something that uh, one of our uh, researchers, Claudio Cellani, who is Italian and therefore is a master of conspiracies, pointed out. <laughs> Uh, and I'm talking about the triple curve, Jose, if you put that up. Uh, he, what, what, what Claudio had said is that if you look at what's actually happening in the derivatives markets, the bond markets, and you look at what's going on around the issues of housing, the dropping of the prices, all these things are shadows of a process in which you've got, you're reaching a boundary condition in the system. Now, the illustration on your screen was devised by Lyndon LaRouche back in 1995, because Lynn was trying to give people who didn't have a background in economics a way of visualizing a process that had been going on for the past half century. If you start at the far left of the screen where all three of those lines are together, that is approximately the time of 1970 when you had a close correlation between physical economic uh, uh, output, uh, money that was issued against that uh, that physical economic output, and then a certain amount of financial aggregates, be those stocks or bonds or other uh, instruments uh, for credit largely. And, and it, these things were in close correspondence. As you uh, went from the 1971 taking of the dollar off the gold standard, you began to get a divergence. And what you're seeing at the far right of the screen with the two circles uh, that are there, where the lines intersect between uh, monetary and financial aggregates, and the physical economic input and output is the actual process that's going on. So what you'll notice, everybody will notice, is that whenever something about a war is brought up or something about climate change is brought up uh, or anything about any primary change, it always translates to somehow the physical economic well-being of people in the transatlantic gets worse. You know, less investment is made in roads, bridges, highways, tunnels, dams, education, health. Uh, less industry is built. More things are exported. There's more talk about quality of life industries or peculiar kinds of things are called industry, like, you know, the sex worker industry or these, these terms are suddenly being used in these funny ways. And the point is that what Claudio is referencing is that we've reached a point of instability. And so what's happening in the governments of the transatlantic is that they're all basically confronted with the fact that they don't feel that they dare to reverse fundamental policy, which is that they would have to essentially declare much of the financial aggregates uh, of the of the society uh, basically bankrupt and, and, and therefore the banking institutions and Carlin institutions would have to be taken through orderly bankruptcy. That would have to be done by governments. Um, <coughs> and everything is being done possible to prevent that from occurring. I just wanted to put that up as I ask you this question, Harley, which came from the chat. Uh, and it had two parts, but I'll just, just go to the first part. How likely is a Chinese demand for U.S. debt payment to occur? In other words, the Chinese hold about $2 trillion in treasuries or between one and a half and $2 trillion. Are they likely to ask for payment uh, or a refusal to purchase U.S. Treasuries? That's the, well, the Chinese. Have cut, they, they've cut back their purchases quite a bit. But, you know, this this gets at the question of the fraudulent inception of China. The Chinese are not looking for a fight with the United States. They're not looking for overtaking the United States and in fact would prefer to have a cooperation with the United States. Now, this is where the question comes in of the, the, the Xi Jinping offering the United States to become part of the Belt and Road Initiative. 
And for a brief period in the early part of his presidency, Donald Trump seemed interested in that. But as the coronavirus became a, a, a hotter topic, the people like Steve Bannon and others emerged saying, look, this is our opportunity to get China. Uh, Bannon, by the way, who was financially connected to anti-Beijing networks. So you know, the, the line on China, that China's out to get us, they're out to sabotage us. You know, the Chinese are holding on to their, for the most part, holding on to their assets. But they're not willing to accept the U.S. telling them that they have to change their banking system to move toward greater financialization. They were moving in that direction, and they recognized it was the wrong direction, and they stopped it. They stopped it on, on a dime and went back to a Glass-Steagall-style separation of commercial banking and in investment banking. Now, this, I just want to bring this up very briefly, but what the triple curve shows is the effects of financialization of everything, turning everything into a speculative asset. And that's what derivative trading is all about. But what, how did it happen? Deregulation weakened the government's ability to intervene. Privatization, where you give private financial interests control over credit policy. And then shareholder values, so to speak, which is where you figure that the economic success is increasing the wealth of the investors, the stockholders, rather than investing in physical economic production, including research and development, including education, including infrastructure, and so on. It all comes down to the question of who controls the credit. Where does the credit go? And the Chinese correctly decided, having studied the works of Friedrich List and Henry Carey and, and Alexander Hamilton, I'm sure, and probably also the works of Lyndon LaRouche, made the proper decision that the government uh, must make sure that credit gets to those areas which produce real value added for the economy, that is real physical wealth, as opposed to paper valuation. And so the question of where the credit goes is the issue that's one of the key issues in the battle between these two paradigms, because the collapsing paradigm says, no, we must protect the investors, the speculators. And how do you make more money when the physical economy is collapsing? You look for the, the highest returns you can get, which with interest rates going up now, you know, it has another whole shift of money leaving physical production. So this is going to accelerate the collapse. That's what Claudio was pointing out in his discussion on the triple curve. It accelerates the collapse rate. And the only way to reverse that is to have a halt in the speculation, which is basically put the economy through a bankruptcy reorganization, which is what the Schiller Institute's calling for, in which companies that are holding on to financialized or financial instruments that have no underlying value have to justify why they're being kept on their books at, at face value. And you'll find that that's a, a fraud. It's an actual fraud against the, the real economy. And so you use a bankruptcy reorganization to write off and write down all the bad debt. There's no bailout. And the people who made the speculation take the losses. Now, the problem is then it hits things like pension funds. And that's the other issue that's at the center of the United Kingdom debate right now. Why should pension holders suffer because of the excessive stupidity and greed of those trading financial instruments and, and taking people's life savings and putting them into these worthless financial instruments. And so some people are saying, well, shouldn't government protect that? The same people who attacked the government to set up the system are now saying, well, the government should bail it out. Well, the government's responsibility is to do what it can to make sure that people who have lost money in this, if there's anything left after a bankruptcy reorganization, they get repaid. But since there won't be enough to cover that, the government has to make sure that the economy is functioning so that people who can work can get jobs and people who can't can be protected. 
Okay, Mike, uh, there's been a particular request that you might discuss, even though you've discussed this before on this platform, but uh, particularly the public order bill. This came to some people's attention because of uh, it being referenced in a, in a couple of recent media reports here. And what says this is a bill about uh, people who protest and they're being, I think, electronically monitored for a period of time and so on. But if you would just tell people a bit, has this passed? Is it pending to be passed? Uh, there seems to be con some confusion as to whether it was actually passed under Liz Truss or not. So if you could first uh, do that, and then I have a second part to the question. Uh, no, it hasn't passed yet. It was supposed to be uh, laid back, brought back into Parliament by uh, Kemi Badnock, who was the Home Secretary on Tuesday last week, but then she resigned. Uh, and uh, so, so uh, I believe it went. Uh, I believe it went back, but but it's not. It hasn't made any further progress. So there were two. There were two main uh, bills. If we go back a year or so, that were announced. Uh, a year or two that were announced. One was the Police Crime Court Sentencing Act a bill, and the other was was this one. Now the the Police Crime Court Sentencing Bill passed and became an act, and it pr put some additional restrictions on on public protest. But the, the, this this new bill uh, puts puts even more on it, specifically. Uh, Targets the uh, you know things like uh, so-called locking on, which is where people effectively you know uh, attach themselves to to physical infrastructure, it makes it very hard for the police to remove them. They have to bring in specialist teams to uh, to get them out of the way and so on. Um, but nonetheless, it it has a massive uh, uh, chilling effect, or will do on on uh, on you know peaceful protest. Uh, as well as as protest, which is a bit more radical, shall we say? Uh, but it, it 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 it'll be across the board. So so that and the the online safety bill and and the other bills that I've mentioned really uh, will have a, a massive impact if they pass on uh, the ability of people to to resist uh, government policy. Um, now, of course, the longer this chaos goes on, uh, the further these things get pushed down the road, and the more opportunity there is for for uh, people that are campaigning around these bills to to get their message out. So we should, uh, I think, people should be taking advantage of the opportunities that uh, that present themselves, and and this this delay because you know th there'll be a new prime minister. That prime minister will attempt to pursue that legislative uh, uh, timetable. And is the chaos going to end if Boris Johnson comes back? No, it's going to continue because, as I say, he didn't ever end up being uh, sort of properly challenged over uh, the reason that he was fired and, or that he had to resign in the first place. Uh, or there could be a general election, which would mean that there's no uh, government for, for uh, well, weeks. Uh, and uh, so... There is an opportunity at this point to, to, for people that are campaigning on these topics to, to uh, make some progress before uh, these bills get any further opportunity to pass through Parliament. Okay. Uh, Harley, this question is from, is from Sophia. She asks, why is Germany still backing the Green Party? Uh, why is Germany not worried about losing their factories? And she says, I just heard the BMV is moving from UK to China. So, question. Well, I, I think we're seeing people beginning to react to the Green Party, where the, particularly the industrial associations. Uh, there, there's some indication that maybe even the labor movement will come out of their slumber. I mean, labor has been quiet because they historically are associated with the Social Democrats and Schultz. The, the biggest problem in Germany is that the, there's been an incredible brainwashing around green policy. You know, if you, virtually anyone you talk to in Germany and you bring up that the idea of man-made climate change is a hoax, they look at you as though you're crazy. And this has been a, a long-term process that goes back to the emergence of the Greens in the 80s and, and 90s. But what we're seeing now is a, the beginning of a backlash against this. And, and this is why I've been watching very closely what Sarah Wagenknecht has been doing She's becoming increasingly vocal. And of course, the, the Lynx Partei, the left, was part of the, the Green movement, but they never fully went with the Greens because, as Wagen Connect said in a, a statement yesterday, the Greens have always been pro-war. 
or not always, but I've, have become increasingly pro-war. Now, I think that's the connection people have to make. What's the connection then between the war policy and the green policy? Well, it, the, the best way to get that is to look at uh, what King Charles said when he was Prince Charles, when he said we need military style operations to impose the Green New Deal, by which he meant deindustrialization. And how do you do that? You destroy the countries that want to industrialize and or that are already industrialized, as we see happening in throughout Europe, the shutdown of, of uh, modern industry. So I think that awareness is, is beginning to emerge, uh, but we need more people to speak out. There need to be more people, people in industry, people in the uh, political parties, including social democrats, including the CDU. I mean, it was the social democrats under Schroeder who initially signed the deals with, with Russia, and then it was continued with Angela Merkel. And now all of a sudden, in the last year, you have everyone saying we should never become dependent on Russian oil and gas. Well, Russian oil and gas was part of the uh, German industrial economy. Now, there's also the question of what will Germany do with China? Will Germany go along with the anti-China policy of the European Union? So I think there are a lot of these questions that aren't answered, but I can tell you our organization in Germany, which is small, but is known for many years as an opponent of the green policy, uh, as, as a promoter of the idea of German industry being used to uh, cooperate or, or supplement what's being done by China and Africa, uh, the commitment to development. That's the fight we're waging. And people who are listening to this program in Germany, join us, get into this fight. Don't wait for someone else to come out and speak up because it's not going to happen. We need the citizens to take action. Hey, uh, we ought to show on the screen the upcoming conference that we'll be having, having on this coming Thursday. I believe that's October 27th. Uh, Jose, if you have that there, we can put that up on the screen. Stop the danger of nuclear war. Um, this is our attempt to assemble some uh, presently serving and former uh, parliamentarians, jurists, members of Congress, state legislators, and other thinkers. Uh, but it's not really, it's not exclusive, and, and it will be online on uh, this coming Thursday. Uh, more on that conference at the Schiller Institute site. And we'll also say more about this at the end of the program. Now I have, uh, let's see, so I have sort of, these are I think more in the area of, in one sense, cultural questions, but they're nonetheless important. Now, what well, one is not that. This is from Kenneth, and this is to Mike. Uh, it, what's happening, if anything is happening, regarding the UK independent child abuse inquiry and the ongoing cover up of child abuse in the UK and elsewhere? Is the inquiry a whitewash? In a sense, it is, yes. I mean, it, the report came out uh, a, a couple of days ago uh, and was uh, deeply critical of, of uh, historic child abuse. Uh, I'm talking about institutional child abuse. So, so uh, uh, But th they, they never really uh, uh, properly investigated the, part, the, the links between or the, the, the abuse, the alleged abuse that was carried out by parliamentarians over the years. But aside, the main problem with it is it's all it, it, it all focuses on the historic um, and uh, nothing about what's going on today. So so in a sense, the outcome of it is that that well, that's something that all happened then. It was all very bad. We've got to make sure it never happens again. But it's, it really was in the past. So so you know, uh, as I said earlier, uh, the, the you know Jimmy Savile was was probably the the most uh, uh, well known. Uh, uh, Name associated with with uh, this really disgusting behaviour, but but his connections into uh, not only the royal family, but but other um, uh, shall we say establishment figures. Um, so he he was. Uh, uh, my point here is that that, that you know that this institutional 
uh, abuse continues today. Uh, the, the, the inquiry was only focusing on what happened in the past. So in that sense, it is a whitewash. Uh, and really, it's not going to contribute to solving the problem at the moment. Uh, and there are many, many people, including uh, the present monarch, who have some questions to answer in, in uh, many people's minds. Okay, uh, Harley or Mike, the question is asked that there's a book by Prince Charles called Harmony, A New Way of Looking at Our World. And the questioner who's Miles is asking if either one of you has read it, if you have any comment. If not, we'll continue. I haven't read it. I'm not uh, familiar with it. No. Okay, great. So uh, now, so we have uh, two questions. Uh, okay, uh, one, one is uh, to, to, to you, Mike. Uh, was list was the list trust debacle completely scripted? She looks so happy to resign. She gets a great paycheck for life. The globalists the globalists intended for Sunak to become prime minister, and now they win. That was the statement. I I think you've sort of implicitly answered that already, but I want to tell you that. And then Harley, you have also from Miles. He he asked this. He says I went to a big chain store. They have about sixteen versions. 16 versions of the board game Monopoly and also the game Risk. Both are winner-take-all games, even versions for little kids. Is this indoctrination? So which of you would like to go first? I think Mike. <laughs> yeah, because you, yeah. Uh, well, let's you wait and see whether Rishi... Would... Yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, I mean, at the moment, Rishi seems to be in the lead. But, but if we think back to the previous contest, uh, the people that were in the lead didn't end up being in the lead at the end. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to, to that, uh, whether he was uh, ever intended to be uh, the, the prime minister or not. Uh, only time's going to tell. But uh, you know, it, it, there is no doubt that it, it, despite the fact that I, I had deep suspicions that Liz Truss was going to end up winning uh, the, the last leadership election, it it in many ways is massively surprising that she did because um, she was never a terribly a, a terribly impressive figure. Um, she never came across as being necessarily the sharpest tool in the box. And why they chose her, uh, I I can't really offer any ex explanation for it other than to suggest that perhaps uh, it's indicative of of the sort of level that uh, of thinking that there is in the political class in general um, because because you know as much as I have uh, no particular respect for um, anybody that I've known in politics over the last 50 years uh, I don't think I think if you were to compare you know the current crop of politicians with the the crop of politicians that we had in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, intellectually, there's a significant difference. There's a significant gap there. So, so perhaps Liz Truss is merely a a, a result of of a, a, the bigger problem. Yes, there's a banality of evil case. Uh, Harley, me might want to hold your uh, response because we only have uh, basically. Well, two other, one other question and then one request. Uh, and then we're going to go, I think I go, we'll go to uh, final remarks. Uh, Mike, there's a question that just came in, which asks you for you to comment on Defense Secretary Ben Wallace's recent trip to Washington. Uh, Harley made comments about it, but I'd like to hear Mike's perspective as to why Wallace would have visited Washington so suddenly. What do you think is the purpose of the visit was? There's also been talk of British Union, a Brit, one, one, British unions warning of synchronized strikes throughout the winter. Uh, ballots for strike action in November were cast by health workers, ambulance workers, and civil servants as the cost of basic necessities are reaching their peak. Uh, and they're sort of asking whether or not these events or other events are um, of great concern to, uh, to the Anglo-Americans. Uh, on, on the strike, the strikes continue. There were there, there were there was a major uh, rail disruption today because the railway workers were were striking in many parts of the country. Um, <clears throat> the, the unions are uh, uh, continuing to to push for 
uh, strikes, uh, the, they didn't really happen during the summer, mainly, I think, because of the death of the Queen. Uh, so most of the sort of schedule of strikes over the summer was pushed back to the autumn and the winter. But just to give one example of, of uh, one thing that's going on, uh, postal workers uh, are uh, have generated a, or created a, a way of running their strikes where, in fact, between now and Christmas, there'll be something like... Uh, uh, 12 or 15 full days of, of strikes in, in uh, November uh, and, and the first part of December, um, while only you know, you know, each, each sort of category of postal worker will only actually have to uh, uh, strike on, on a third of those days each. So, so they've, they're taking different, char char sorry, different uh, categories of workers and, and each category is striking on separate days, so they'll, they'll, they'll uh, have the maximum disruption in the run-up to Christmas. This is going to be the same for railways, uh, nurses, teachers, they're all talking about uh, striking. Uh, many of them already have a, 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 a timetable in place. So uh, yes, it's going, to be, it's going to be a difficult winter for many, many people. Uh, as, as, but the unfortunate side of this, at least I, I feel it's unfortunate, is that the unions aren't really uh, offering any kind of uh, proper explanation as to, you know, they're not giving any uh, proper explanation about what the, the economy is really doing or why uh, their members are uh, facing a cost of living crisis. Uh, they're merely focusing on getting an extra few percent on salaries, which may be a, a short-term fix, but it isn't going to solve anything in the medium, medium or long term. So I think the unions themselves are very much uh, uh, missing an opportunity. Uh, maybe that's uh, because of the leadership that they have in place. Um, ben Wallace's trip to the United States, well, uh, uh, don't really have anything, uh, any great insight on that, uh, um, other than, you know, just to, to, to make the point that at the NATO uh, defence minister's uh, meeting a week or two ago, the, the UK was very much... Uh, announced that they were going to supply some of the equipment for uh, air missile defences for Ukraine. So the United States is providing some uh, of the hardware and the UK is providing uh, a part of the hardware hardware as well. So whether it was to do with, with that, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, so uh, I can't really add any more to that at the moment. Okay. Well, very good. I think we're pretty much at the conclusion. I just kind of want to uh, sort of offer this as a way for you guys to think of uh, this. There, there's a, uh, a question that was asked. I won't say who asked it, which is a general question in by way of which I want to make a comment and then let you go ahead, each of you, and respond. And that question was, uh, oh, it's another one has just come in. Let's just see what it is. Sorry getting a lot of questions today just rang uh well okay so th you can think about this mike but in the context of what i'm doing the question's from philomena and she asked do you believe that the city of london or whoever chooses the british prime minister would choose a non-anglo-saxon for the job actually given the experience of barack obama i would say absolutely since they already did that um in the case of the United States. Uh, so the question that was to be asked to each of you was, is there any truth to the rumor that the old British occult bureau has been involved in attempting to revive Elizabeth to reassume leadership of the empire? <laughs> and is it true that there is a faction fight as to which Elizabeth should be revived? I think that's probably an intelligence question, Mike, you can just think about uh, investigating. But the thing I do want to bring up and just say is that Piers Morgan at some point last week, I guess right after the day of the uh, resignation, said, not that he's, of course, the <laughs> great authority, but he did say, it is literally impossible to exaggerate the scale of the bedlam that this government has unleashed on our country in the last six weeks. These useless clowns have basically ravaged our country. Uh, I don't know that that's a surprising statement from Piers Morgan. But I just think that, um, you know, the question is that we're seeing, and you re began referencing it before, Mike, a ratcheting down in the caliber of leadership. But at the same time, 
we have perhaps the greatest crisis, certainly since the Second World War, probably, uh, and certainly since the Cuban Missile Crisis in any case. So in that context, uh, as we look at this present circumstance, what do you both expect? What do you recommend? Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, what do you think people, how do you think people should uh, proceed uh, given what we've talked about today? So we'll start with you, Mike, first. With any, whatever you've got to say, either on that or any other final remarks you'd like to make. Uh, yeah, look, look uh, I, I don't really, I'm, I'm not really sure how to answer that, but uh, I think that that uh, as as this winter goes on, um, people are going to be becoming more and more stressed. As Harley said earlier. Uh, the British government uh, absolutely willing to, to starve people and have them freezing to death uh, in order to, to push forward with this uh, uh, exercise in Ukraine. Um, I think that uh, while this is absolutely tragic for people, it can only motivate people. And so uh, I, I, I feel that, that uh, people tend to only become active whenever they're ex most people I'm talking about politically active at least whenever they're facing some kind of existential threat. I think there's so many existential threats uh, coming at people at the moment uh, that they're going to have lots and lots of questions uh, and they're going to they're going to be wanting to do something about it and I think that uh, there is an opportunity therefore for people that perhaps have uh, had uh, their eye on the ball for a little bit longer to offer some answers and maybe help people uh, uh, apply whatever motivation they have in the right direction. I don't know if that comes close to, to answering that. I think that's fine. Uh, Harley? Well, let me go back to what I started with, the statement from Putin that we're in a period of fundamental transformation of politics and economics. And this is something that requires serious deliberation. It requires diplomacy. It requires an understanding of history. It, it requires an empathy and a love for people from other cultures, as opposed to a herding uh, of people of like-minded views. Now, look at the, the, I don't think Liz Truss looked so happy, maybe relieved, but I think befuddled and shocked much more describes her, her behavior. She probably believed she checked all the right boxes. She was a radical neoliberal ideologue. That was her economic policy, and it's been her thinking for years that, that she would be the new Thatcher, uh, and that she's also a, a rabid anti-Russian, anti-China neocon, a war hawk. So she obviously thought that, that she was the right person for the job, up to including the point that she said she's prepared to push the nuclear button. And so the fact that the, there was a turning against her probably shocked her completely. But I think what the people who run the United Kingdom, including the, the Bank of England, the City of London, and so on, what they recognized in her is that she's incapable of selling the policy. She's not a, an intellect, she's not eloquent, and she's not someone who could convince people that they have to suffer for the sake of the people of Ukraine, much less suffer for the sake of the speculators of the city of London. Now, a similar situation is happening in the United States. You have the House uh, Minority Leader McCarthy questioning whether there should be continued aid to Ukraine when the people in the United States are starting to suffer. Uh, one example that I, I've used in talking with people about how to talk to your congressman is why are we putting together another $50 billion aid package when the family members of U.S. servicemen are forced onto food stamps to be able to feed their children? So this is, as, as Mike was just saying, as this crisis deepens, and it's not going to resolve itself because the people running things don't have solutions, as it deepens, there's going to be a cry for real leadership. This is why LaRouche was slandered and vilified for so many years, because he actually represents an alternative 
philosophical leadership at a time when that's the only thing that will work. And those people who are, are watching us, listening to us, reading our material, you can't take the time to uh, sit around anymore and say, well, I don't think it'll happen. We have to make the change happen. This is a moment where it is happening worldwide. It has to occur, the, the shift away from monetarism, the shift away from neoconservatism, neoliberalism has to happen now. And the leadership for this, whether you like it or not, is the LaRouche movement. But you can join us, read our material, study it, and go out and be a spokesman for it. That's the only way we're going to change things for the better. Mike Robinson, Harley Schlanger, we want to thank you for being with us today. We want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, we want to now also remind you that this coming Thursday, we have a conference called For War Peace for world peace, stop the danger of thermonuclear war. Uh, and uh, that conference will be from 10 a.m. Eastern time until 1 p.m., three-hour seminar. Uh, and it's focused on bringing together various uh, leaders from around the world. Uh, and you're all invited to uh, be part of that conference. Uh, today, we took as a theme for the program, overturning the axioms that are leading us to catastrophe. In the last two weeks, in particular, there have been real uh, examples of that. Uh, there was the intervention that became notorious and was seen by over 25 million people around the world, done by Kynan Thistlewaite and Jose Vega on the Congress person, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, and was simply exemplary of what all citizens should begin to do. People talked about its eloquence and many other things. But the truth of the matter is that all the citizens of the nation should show up and hold their legislative representatives accountable, particularly when you know, as we showed you today, that many of them have known the nature of this Ukrainian regime that now has come to power and then that country and is now come to power is prosecuting a war against the other great greatest nuclear power in the world. Uh, a, a, a circumstance that we were extraordinarily careful about in years gone by, particularly after the erection in 1961 of the Berlin Wall up through the time that the Berlin Wall came down. You could literally be removed, even if you were a military person, uh, from the military, uh, the vicinity of, 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 of Germany, uh, if you even so much as took a picture uh, inadvertently uh, in traveling in Berlin, for example, East Berlin in particular, I mean, uh, and we were that careful. Now we have a situation in which people routinely talk about the use of tactical nuclear weapons, pretending that that would come from Russia, when in fact, the nuclear doctrine of the United States uh, uh, has never committed itself to not using nuclear weapons first. And more importantly, that the declaration of Russia as a terrorist organization, if that actually occurred, would mean that the notion of the extraordinary circumstance in which a nuclear weapon might be used could be right upon us in the case of uh, Ukraine, should, shall we say, some fool, not Russia, decide to detonate a tactical nuclear weapon, then use that as the pretext to retaliate, for example. That kind of thing is not only thinkable in the present circumstance, there's nothing to deter that from occurring. There's not even a uh, an adequate inspection of the distribution of weapons in Ukraine, uh, not to mention the biological laboratories and many other things that go on there. So the, 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 ch the possibilities of this occurring, especially in a world where whole pipelines are blown up and people claim that they don't know who it was, uh, you know, that, that these kinds of things are eminently possible. Matter of fact, they are even likely under certain circumstances. So citizens have to decide to act. It's difficult if you're in a, the parliamentary uh, despotism, uh, living in the parliamentary despotism of Britain. I mean, you just heard it. Uh, these are people that now are going to get a new leader. They're not going to vote at all. You're going to have 0.1% of the population determining that. And yet that's called a free society as opposed to a failed state. And so, uh, if you, and, and if you look at what the caliber of what is about to be brought into power is, uh, where there's, as the Chinese have pointed out, no change in the mindset, but merely a change in the person. Clearly, this is not a recipe for, for durable survival. 
And this is what we have to therefore ensure. In the case of the United States, of course, there's a tendency to be very focused on the November 8th elections, which will be in just over uh, two weeks, I guess, 17 days. Uh, but there's nothing meaningful about those elections unless prior to those elections, actions happen in which sane voices within the United States and other part portions of the Anglosphere step up against these policies and stop these failed states. Since people are in the streets in France and Germany and other locations in Europe, uh, pretty, much, pretty much sort of the advance of what you're going to see in the United States should this continue. Uh, there is a possibility, since they are doing what they're doing, that we can see sane voices emerge. But what has to happen is that we have to reverse direction. Uh, and that means overturning the axioms that are leading us, meaning we the people, to catastrophe. As Linda LaRue said in the, our opening segment, we have to go after the people because the problem is with them. Uh, as one of our old collaborators used to say, uh, you always contribute at least 51% to your own oppression. And you have to take your 51% out of uh, any matter, any dispute that you're having of any type. Uh, and if you do that, then that dispute will fall of itself. Uh, the idea of creative, nonviolent, direct action, including uh, through the electoral process, is actually a time-honored tradition in the United States. Uh, many people have never really understood the true significance of Martin Luther King. He tends to be seen as a civil rights leader and often just a, quote, black leader, neither of which is really the case. He was something else. He was the most qualified person to become president of the United States uh, at the time that he was assassinated. Uh, he did not have to become president of the United States. In fact, it was better that he act as he did as the moral uh, conscience or at least a moral compass of the of the nation. This is the sort of thing we have to return to. And in the case of the uh, candidacies that some, are in some independent candidacies that are out there, Diane Sayre has been mentioned in particular, running for U.S. Senate as an independent candidate in New York or other such candidates as that begin to emerge, uh, both in the United States and otherwise, this is our time. And, and people should recognize that it isn't the amount of resources you have, it's the clarity of the placement of truth uh, in, 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 a, in a person that is calling upon others to respond to it. That's what the world needs right now, and that's what we can provide. And so, we hope that you will join us in our Thursday conference and you will join us otherwise in raising your voice to stop the insanity of the drive toward thermonuclear war coming from the Anglosphere and the poor victims of perfidious Albion, including even some of its own so-called erstwhile leaders, such as Liz Truss. So on behalf of the LaRouche organization uh, and the Manhattan Project, we bid you good afternoon.